Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Glory to Jesus Christ. Glory forever. Good morning. So we preached, and so you believed. These words come to us from St. Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, and I'm interested in this text this morning because of the causality that's implied. Causality means one thing is related to another in that this first thing causes, effects, or brings about the second. So in this case, with this text, it's the preaching and the believing that are co-related. Specifically, it's the preaching that causes or brings about the believing. And this is a very key idea for St. Paul. St. Paul really believes in the centrality of preaching the gospel. That the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, it must be declared and demonstrated in order for people to accept this salvation that comes to them in the living person of Jesus Christ. And so St. Paul also says that for faith comes through hearing and what is heard comes through the preaching of the gospel. It comes through the preaching of the gospel. Now what we also want to know this morning is that preaching is not only something that concerns the clergy, the bishops, the priests, and sometimes the deacons, but it's the, it's the responsibility of us all. We do it formally in the churches, but we also do it informally in many different ways. As St. Paul again says, in season and what? Out of season. Wherever we have that opportunity. And so we can ask ourselves this question in the Orthodox Church. What makes for good preaching? What makes for good preaching? Not just in terms of what the priest might have to say in his sermon every Sunday morning, but for all of us in the way that we speak of Christ, in the way that we speak of Christ. And there are three things specifically that I believe make for good preaching. The first of these things is right content. Right content. In the Orthodox Church, we have this central focus, as we just stated, on the living person of our Lord Jesus Christ. So that when we speak about our faith, we do not speak about simply a religion. Orthodoxy is not really a religion. It's not really a religion in the classical sense. Somebody might come into our church and say, well, it looks like a religion. I heard the story about um, a woman who was Pentecostal from Detroit and was invited to go to Moscow and she went to a three-hour divine liturgy in this Russian Orthodox Cathedral of St. Basil the Great and she came out after that liturgy with all of that splendor and with all of that ceremony and she said to her best friend, now that's what I call religion. <laughs> but orthodoxy isn't religion. Orthodoxy isn't a philosophy. It's not a morality even for the sake of morality only. Orthodoxy is this new life of our Lord Jesus Christ that we pass on and share with each other, first through our words, and then, as we'll see, through our own demonstration. So Christ himself is the content of this message, which is the power of the gospel. Many of our adversaries, for example, when our children here are going to the university, they're going to hear from many of their friends and perhaps from some of their professors that Christianity is all just a great big religious fairy tale. It's like Peter Pan, or um, Peter Rabbit, or it's like Peter Parker. You know who Peter Parker is, right? Um, so we say, well, what makes the gospel story different from the story of Peter Parker? Well, first of all, Peter Parker is fiction, right? Peter Parker is fiction. Christ is a historical figure, and all of this that happened to Jesus happens in history. It happens in history. There's a reality about it, a truthfulness about it. There's a force about it that Christ has entered into our own human history and has given it 
shape and direction and meaning. And the other thing about the content of the gospel as being Jesus himself is that it's this person who changes us. St. Paul says, if any man is in Christ, he is a new creation. And this is the difference between the gospel and all of these fairy tales. Tell me how Peter Rabbit or Peter Pan or Peter Parker or Peter Griffin, we can talk about Peter Griffin, how any of these changes us on the inside. None of them do. It's only the living person of Christ. And this is what we preach as we hear in the book of Acts. This Jesus, this Jesus God raised up says the Holy Apostle Peter, and made him to be both Lord and Christ. This Jesus, again, whom you crucify. Whom you crucify. The second thing is to have the right motive. Many people preach the gospel, and I sometimes feel that somehow their, their motive might be compromised out of self-interest. And even St. Paul in his letter to the Philippians speaks about those who preach the gospel basically out of self-interest, out of envy, out of rivalry. Many people preach the gospel because they want that kind of influence. Many people preach the gospel because they can make money at it. Sinclair Lewis wrote a very famous book. And actually, I, I would recommend you all reading it. Um, because it really shows what goes wrong with wrong preaching. And the book is called Elmer Gantry. How many of you have read the book Elmer Gantry? And Elmer Gantry, he knew how to motor his mouth. He knew how to motor his mouth quite well. And he did so basically in order to fleece his flock out of their money and their wives. Read the book. It's a tragedy. The motive of our preaching is simply the love of God. That's all. When I was ordained, my spiritual father told me, he said, Beware of what you're looking for in terms of a reward with your ministry. Because if you are looking for any other kind of reward except to please God, then your work, then your work is doomed. Then it's doomed to failure. We preach for the love of God. It is kind of like giving people what they need the most in order to be saved. I love the story about the Iditarod. How many of you know what the Iditarod race is? It's a sled dog race. And it goes from Anchorage to the city of Nome. And in 1925, there was this terrible diphtheria um, um, epidemic in Nome. And so um, all of these children were dying. And so they came up with this way of delivering this cure, this medicine, by getting this medicine from Anchorage to Rome, well, you can't get there by road. There are no roads. You can't get there by railroad. There are no railroad tracks. How do you get there? By dog sled. And so this sled, um, this sledding went on for five and a half days. I read a book about it. It's really wonderful. There were 150 sled dogs. And five and 20 different riders who took that uh, cure, took that medicine from Anchorage to Nome, almost a thousand miles, I think it was 800 miles, so that that city could literally be saved. The gospel for us is this medicine that we offer to other people so that they can be healed from this disease of sin, death, and hell itself. And unless we um, see that urgency about getting to Nome, getting this right here to Nome in the same kind of way that I don't think we really understand what the motive of the gospel is. That God has laid upon us this terrible responsibility that if we do not serve these other people by giving them this cure, then we ourselves has failed. We failed in our calling as Christians. And finally, the other important, the most important thing about right preaching is that there has to be right example. Because what I love about the way we Orthodox people look at preaching is that we begin with ourselves. We begin with our own repentance. We begin by struggling and striving 
to hear the gospel ourselves every day so that this change can take place. And the change that we're talking about in Greek, metania, a transformation of the mind or the mind in the heart, it's this great turnaround. That's really what it means, this great turning. And we turn ourselves every day, every hour, every minute by reorienting all of our thoughts, all of our desires, all of our intentions. We turn that all back to God. And the more that we do that ourselves, the more effective our preaching is going to be. Christ himself, he was the only one who ever did what? Practice what he preached. He was the only one. The rest of us, we fail in that. And yet we can try. We can try the best we can by keeping the horse before the cart, by remembering that what we do makes a difference in what we say. And this is why I'm fascinated in church history, that very often in our church, the most wonderful, the most effective, um, most effective preachers, evangelists, they're monastics. They're monks and nuns meaning that they were never even called to be preachers, but how they lived made such an amazing, made such an amazing difference in the lives of other people um, who were around them. So may God help us to remember that we're all called to speak this good word about Christ, um, that this word uh, must be something that is genuine in our lives, that we carry it to, to each other, and that it makes no difference at all whatsoever um, unless we hear that word and we live by that word ourselves. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.